Welcome to Smash Writing, and we are concluding a fun year of uh, movies. Uh, today's episode, the best of 2023. I'm Paul. This is Justin. Let's go. You could help sound any less enthusiastic Dude, over this, this list. This, uh, I mean, this was a busy year for me in my off life, in my personal life, but like, when I watch these films, like, making this list, honestly, like, I've watched a lot of 2023 films that I, I didn't realize I actually watched until I started looking back at everything, and I remember texting just going, like, everything I was watching that yeah. I wanted to watch was disappointing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, those are, like, coming up with the top ten was easy, but then placing some of these was real hard. I was going to get through with, um, Four, five, and six changed around a lot on my list. And one and two were almost neck and neck. When I thought there was no chance anything would knock off number one, number two came along and went, no, not so fast here. <laughs> Here's your fandom right in your face. <laughs> well, my, my list was, like I said, was difficult in some ways because every there is a lot of films that I wanted to watch that I was hopeful that was going to be entertaining to watch, and it kind of just fell on its face. So... Yeah, um, since some of us match, some of ours matches, why don't you start with your number 10? My number 10 is Wrath of Becky, which almost... Home Alone on Roids. Yeah, not so much this one. Not this not one. Not so much this one. I haven't one. watched this one, so I can't wait um, to... This one is here off the back of Lulu Wilson, just because she is really, really entertaining. This wasn't as good as the first one. <clears throat> Seeing Sean Willem Scott as a villain was really fun, and he was good. Uh, Lulu Wilson was amazing. The deaths were a lot of fun. It was a bit little ham-fisted, like it would like tone some of it back. Like, just we get it. They're bad guys. I'm sold. You you can stop now. I'm already here. Wait, I'm waiting for her to start killing people. Other than that, this is a fun movie. I want another one. Just because I think, it, where are you gonna go? You know the crazy part is I remember that I told you about yeah. Becky. Yeah. You were like thrown off. I was like, you know, there's a sequel now coming out. Like, what? And yeah, rap with Becky. Um, we'll go with my number ten because it's your number nine as well. Dungeons and Dragons, uh, Honor Among Thieves. Um, I literally, prior to recording this video, I've been wanting to watch this film practically since it came out. Um, I enjoy. I want to say like I want to say like I'm a Chris Pine true fan, but I, there's parts of, like, he has this certain role about him, like, being a goofy leader. I, I'm definitely not a Chris Pine fan. He's alright, but uh, I like him in this, I like him in the stereotypical role of being a goofy leader. Like, any film that he's in that he's, like, different from the goofy leader, I don't think it's a natural fit for him. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can go down a list of films, but, like, some of my favorite films of him, in it, he is a goofy goofy leader that has his serious moments at times, but you get what, um, so I think you got him at his, one of his best performances. Um, the, the best part was when, like, the opening part of the film for me was when he's giving his backstory, <laughs> and they're stopping him, and then he goes back, and they're like, no, you're going too far back. And the best part of it is, he, they break out. And they're like, we were going to give you parole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think he kept stopping his story. Like, if only was it Johnson was here. And they're like, we don't need him here. <laughs> yeah. So it, it it was very entertaining. Uh, I, I do like the callback at the end when he tried to do the stuff. One guy tried to rip off Pine by grabbing the bird and jumping out of the window, but they bricked it up. Yeah. <laughs> that was a fun little callback. Um, some of the jokes didn't land for me, but it felt like this is a really great way to introduce you into this world. Yeah, yeah. So, like, it, it could do you, it could do them good to, like, getting new, player, new players into the game to bouncing off to a sequel. But from my heart, this movie didn't do so well at the box office. For, so, to my, so I, like... I didn't look up numbers, but... So, numbers-wise, yeah, it it broke even off $150 million. Like, the budget was $150 million, but, you know, with marketing, yeah. and it grossed, like, $210 million. So... But to be fair, nothing really did well at the box office this year. 
No, I think you can literally count but like there were two billion dollar films this year, and that was about it. With one starting the billion dollar marker, and pretty much every this year with every heavy set heavyweight player that you thought was going to get like eight hundred, nine hundred billion dollar, they failed to do so. Yeah. So you can chalk it up to a couple of things. Um, Inflation yeah, be, and being poor. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like, you know, with us re- reviewing movies a lot, um, I have, like, every streaming service there is. And openly knowing outside of a select few movies, most of these movies are going to be on streaming within weeks. Dude, I'm going back to DVD. If I can. You like, best buy. Thanks a lot. No one's selling DVDs anymore. How are you going to get rid of DVDs and Blu-rays, Best Buy, when it made you $789 million in 2022 when COVID was shutting everything down still? I'm, I'm not inventing okay. about that. Go with your number nine. Uh, my number nine uh, is Transformers Rise of the Beast. This, I, I was so glad that Michael Bay went away from the franchise and yes some of this humor was stereotypical humor um, but I thought this was a good start maybe to reintroduce the uh, Transformers back to us Um, there's definitely gave me some questions rather than answers Um, I know that when they make series and they don't plan these films out ahead they watch the stories and stuff like this Um, but they gotta do some explaining of how Omnis Prime was already on Earth, um, but it was still a fun, a fun little ride. Uh, I gotta admit, like it almost felt like this was focusing on a, not a strong story, so. But it definitely was better than Bay's. I'm going to blow shit up and not give you any story. So that's what it felt like to me, and I, I generally enjoyed it. I actually did like the Omnis Prime of not trusting humans. Because you're like, oh, man, they're going to fuck you over later, too. So, like, relax. Um, I, I did like the introduction of the uh, the beast um, beings. I probably, probably could have went a little bit more heavy on them. But I know you got to have Optimus Prime and his team until you kind of go full way with that. But nevertheless, it was actually a pretty <coughs> decent little ride uh, to enjoy. And that's my number nine, Transformers. Rise of the Beast. Uh, my number eight is Across the Spider-Verse. I was really hyped to watch this movie. It took a bit too long to get to it, but it definitely delivered. I loved going big into uh, Gwen Stacy's world. I love the art style of her world. It was incredible to see. Uh, I didn't really care too, too much about like the canon thing. That uh, kind of annoyed me because it's like every Spider-Man fucks canon like, all the time. <laughs> That's why Spider-Man's not normally on a team. <laughs> but uh, I'm still definitely very, very invested in Beyond the Spider-Verse whenever that comes out. And I'm looking forward to seeing where this continues on to. And of course, seeing just all the Spider-Men in this world where it's a lot of fun too. <laughs> you know, I, I, I know you made me watch the first one. So I'm glad you didn't make me watch the second one. I don't know. See? No, oh, that's because you're a bitch. <laughs> Ew, it's animated. Whatever shall I, just, I do? Certain things oh. in that world don't excite me. What do you want me to say? They just don't... It's their goal. Um, but now my awesome number eight. Yeah, your number eight. The steaming pile of flaming <laughs> dog shit. But because it's a flaming pile of dog shit. No, no, it's not. It's, it's not funny. It's yes, not fun. It it's is. not good. Yes, it is. Well, can I introduce it? No. You know why? Because number one is a funny horror movie. Number eight is a steaming pile of dog shit. I would like to chuck at the director. <laughs> All right, my number eight is Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. It's so bad that it just was fun to watch. No, I don't know. It's Wishmaster 4. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, Wishmaster 4 was just, that's on a whole different level. And it's right above the level of Winnie the Pooh 1. 
I'll say this, you know, it at face value, it yeah, there could have been better writing. I don't know if they were really trying well, or, okay. or just having fun with it. The idea was hilarious. Like in, in when this first came out, like or just the the, the screen title, Wayne the Pooh, Poo, Blood and Honey. You know, now that certain characters are going into the public domain and everybody can now get their rights on them and, and stuff like that. Um, they had a fresh idea, and I think that taking, I know, I know the mean one. They did something with like the uh, the Grinch, and yeah. all that, and now that <clears throat> starting in uh, a couple of days, Willie the Steamboat version of Mickey Mouse is going to go into the uh, public domain as well. Uh, it was a wait, it was wait. a fresh idea. It it was a unique, no, not fresh. I wouldn't say it was a unique idea to take one of the most lovable characters and my wife is a big Winnie the Pooh fan and our daughter's nursery was going to be full out Winnie the Pooh and I'm like I will accept this if we have a poster of Blood and Honey we went to go see Blood and Honey and yeah it's a pile of shit but it was <laughs> no, it no, was it so much of a pile of shit what no no what? it wasn't no it's more than a pile of shit but it, it should this like be chucked at the director and he should go sit in a corner and really think about the missed ball. <laughs> yeah, you left Eeyore out. My wife was disappointed in that. No, no, no. Just, we'll talk later. <laughs> um, but I think because it was so bad, it just caught my eye like... Certain movies just do that to you and this is one of them. To where we can have our different opinions. We can say it's complete trash and I'm not disagreeing. But for some odd reason, I just like it. Um, you don't have to agree with me. I gave him an entire list of movies that are better than this. <laughs> but it just it's just one of those films that, list. It's one of those films that just caught my attention. Um, but that's my number eight. Winnie the Pooh. Blood and Honey. And Can't wait for the sequel. And the reason you'll never be able to complain about another bad movie you watch. <laughs> Not like I want to re rewatch this a hundred million times, but go with your number seven. My number seven is Scream Six. I can almost just complain about everything that the studio has done to fuck up the fact we're not getting a sequel to this. Not anytime soon. No. Ah, the killers weren't the best. I did like the fact that we had three of them this time around. I still really enjoyed Sam and uh, her sister's development here. I enjoyed the kills. I enjoyed the shift up to the cityscape. It's a, a ghost place who was not playing around. Arguably one of the best openings in this franchise. Borderline best opening in the franchise. By how it was handled with the uh, ghost face who just took off his mask at the beginning and said, like, well, wait, what's going on here? And like for a moment you thought maybe you were going to just be following through knowing who the killer was and waiting for them to figure it out. No, 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 it's just... One of the ones that got snapped out by the real one. It is just incredibly fun time to watch. And incredibly, incredibly disappointing that the studio has pissed it all down the toilet. Figuratively and literally. Literally just pissed it like all the amount, away. First, it was Nev Campbell, right? Yeah, well, going in the Scream 6, uh, they supposedly had a money issue with Nev. But then there was talks of like trying to get her back. That fell through. Well, that was after um. They lost Rosa Berry, who played uh, Sam, and then the next day Jordan and Ortega left, and now the director's gone. Because they were talking about bringing back Neve and um, McDreamy. Okay. It's like, well, boy, do bring back those two? Yeah, because Scream Three wasn't a big problem. No, Scream Three wasn't the worst one in this franchise. I thought it was. It was the worst in that franchise. Oh. Have we ever did a Scream ranking? No. Okay. Um, I didn't get to see it. Uh, it kind of hurt because, like, so on my Paramount Plus, somebody watched it. And then it confused me because I'm like, wait, did I watch it? I'm like, <laughs> no, I don't don't remember watching it. So I'm still going to set to watch it. Um, I have nothing wrong with the Scream franchise as a whole. I hope it, I actually hope it continues on. Um, but sounds like it. We ain't gonna get number seven anytime soon. So, that is what made the most amount of money it's seen in the franchise. 
they have the biggest budget too, or? Oh, I don't know. Probably. Probably. And that is Justin's number seven. My number se seven. <clears throat> I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm like I'm a huge fanboy, but uh, I am getting the more and more I watch it, uh, these movies I do begin to like them more. <clears throat> My number seven is Evil Dead Rise. Um, I may... I, the first Evil Dead I watched was the 2013 film. And then I... Is that a remake versus original? Uh, no, I watched it before we did that idea. Um, that idea made me watch the first one. Now, I was... Uh, I used to love watching The Army of Darkness. So, yeah. uh, there are still just inconsistencies in the timeline of me enjoying the film. Um, so, obviously, when Evil Dead Rise came out, um, knowing that, okay, now I'm like, I, I have yet to be able to get to watch um, Ash vs. Evil Dead, is that the title? Yeah, the TV series. Yeah, I have yet to fully get to watch that one just uh, yet, but I'm getting to it. So, wow, Evil Dead Rise. I thought, from watching the franchise to this point, all the little <coughs> callbacks they were going to try to do trying to cut her arm off, but yeah. not actually doing it. I thought that was an awesome touch. Not being in the woods, being in the building, I thought I thought this was an awesome touch, an updated version of a cult classic film. Well, I, I did enjoy the opening whenever you start in the cabin on the theater. I'm like, wait a minute, we're not supposed to be here. Where are we? <laughs> yeah, it, they threw some curveballs at you and kept you on your feet. So, uh, Give it credit. I, I love the evil mom. You know, oh, was, yes. <laughs> that was. Your mom with the maggots now. <laughs> so a lot of a lot of good uh, punchlines, a lot of good scares, a lot of little cliffhangers. They definitely dipped more into the humor than 2013 did. Yeah, yeah, I'll agree with that much. But it fit. Like, I don't have yeah. a problem with it. Um, but yeah, my number seven. Evil did. Right. My number six, Guardians of the Galaxy 3. This was a perfect send off for the group. Mm -hmm. It still had a large amount of humor mixed with really deep, painful stuff between Quill's descendant and the depression over Gamora, and especially I love uh, them being drunk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rocket's backstory really going hard in the rock. Yo, backstory. holy crap, they did. Yeah, that, <laughs> was, that was disturbing. I'm like, even for a. A Marvel slash Disney movie. Like, look at that cute raccoon, man. It's like, yeah, it's not for long. <laughs> yeah. The way they reconstructed his hands and drilled into him, I'm like, oh my god. It even adds like that little ripple that uh, the reason why he likes all those um, robotic limbs and stuff is because it reminds him of his friends. Yeah. That's why he's always taking them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, then you know, like you said, it was a send off for all the characters. Um, they did a good job marketing this too, and making you believe that someone's going to die, and none of them died. You absolute bastards! <laughs> <laughs> but they all they all went on their own their own paths. Um, you know, where Rocket is now the leader of the new Guardians, which you know, see how that what the world brings with the new team. Um, the send off with Quill with him returning back to Earth um, was a good touch with him just like chilling with his grandfather. Like yeah. it's, Man is know. leaving with the uh, three monsters. Yeah. Drax going from the destroyer to like the daddy. Yeah. His special talent was talking to the kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, can't complain about that. Um, sticking. Well, my number six, uh, The Family Plan, um, starring Mark Wahlberg, on, is uh, currently right now on Apple Plus TV. This movie, I don't think the jokes kind of hit, but I think the overall acting, storytelling, fun side of it. Um, so, if you haven't watched The Family Plan yet, uh, it, stars, it stars Mark Wahlberg, and he's been married for 18 years, and... You know, he's a simple dad, worked at a car dealership. His wife is a, a physical therapist uh, instructor or whatever. And they kind of live a suburban life. And all suddenly one day, I think this was the best 
action scene of the year. Mark Wahlberg has his baby. His character is Dean, uh, Dan. And he's taking his You're son. Some things does not change going into 2024. <laughs> but Probably my New Year's resolution, remember to turn off the sound on my phone. Yeah. But anyway, um, so he goes to the grocery store to pick up groceries for his wife. And, and there's been scenes where the wife's openly starting to admit, like, maybe there was more to their life and they never got to live up to them. Then all suddenly, Mark Wahlberg goes on complete, like, somebody's following mode. And there's, and we all like the, the when you have your baby onto your chest, he's fighting this guy. And it's pretty awesome because, like, he's trying to protect his baby. He keeps, I'm like, he's like, can I put my kid down first? No. The, the fight goes on, and he ends up winning. And, and it's revealed that he was a former Delta Force uh, government assassin who decided to leave and his team wants him back and he doesn't want to go back so they're hunting him down and he's doing everything he possibly can to convince his family like he's not like they're just taking a random trip to Vegas despite him throwing out their phones despite driving extra fast and, and speaking four or five different languages it was a generally a fun ride the jokes overall felt felt flat for me like I didn't laugh at the jokes but I laughed at the entertainment part of it um, like being a dad myself now I Ooh. thought it was hilarious so that is my number six the family plan my number five is going to be switched oh a late minute yeah, switch yeah I'm switching oh god I can't my number five is going to be Saw X. Uh, I think this was a hell of a return to fame for this franchise. Uh, the guy's so beaten down by the time Saw 10 came out. <laughs> My God. Don't, don't marathon these movies. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a lot of fun seeing Kramer and Amanda back. They The, the gore was there without being too much like it had gotten into in the later franchise. Uh, it was a lot of fun seeing. Uh, they did a good job ramping up a villain that you wanted to see him get revenge on. Another movie that Paul could have replaced that stupid fucking movie with. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, again, a perfect little twist at the end to just to keep up that um, Hello Jeb song with. It hit all the right notes, and it was a perfect way to spin into another direction with this franchise. And now we know we're getting a limit. Yeah. So. And they're still talking about maybe a jigsaw too. Why? I don't know. <laughs> it makes no sense to have. See, once again, that's where you're gonna kill a good thing. Don't get choked up. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was just weird. <laughs> <laughs> See, look, it makes <laughs> Justin upset already. <laughs> no. Good boy. My God, what the hell happened? I, I double drank there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, that's stupid to have a Jigsaw 2 and then it's all 11. That, the uh, same I fucking mean, franchise. We're going to be running two Batmans here soon, so does it really matter? That is true. That is unfortunately <laughs> true. It's okay, Justin, don't get choked up. Yeah. It, it happens. Um, sometimes studios like to make a good thing and then make it a bad thing. Yeah, scream. What are you doing, Spyglass? <laughs> <laughs> All right, my number five. Um, I actually didn't think this film was as bad. I mean, it's Ant-Man uh, 3, Ant-Man and the Wasp. This movie got a lot of hate. I, and I don't I, understand neither, why. Neither did I. Now, I'm not saying that it's, like, it's a billion dollar film. No. I did enjoy everybody's actual performance. <laughs> I do think uh, Scott Lang's daughter just kind of annoyed me. Like She just felt like she just doesn't need to be part of the hero team and shit like that. I know she might be in going into the Young Avengers and stuff like that, and it makes sense. But her character are just... It felt like it was just forced upon us. And that's the only really part that I I didn't like. Um, Paul Rudd as Ant-Man, he always sells it. Uh, so no problem there. Uh, having the whole team um, was great. I don't... Obviously, we know what's going on with John, John, 
Ben uh, Majors, uh, what an idiot. But I thought his performance as Kang the Conqueror. Yeah, it was really good. It was, was really good, and it would have been a lot of fun to see what they were going to do with him until now, though. But yeah, and it's like you want to talk about pissing away your career. This is what you do. Um, I don't know where the the Kang uh, storyline is now going to go. They were doing something great. I feel like they should at least recast the role into another brilliant actor. There's a lot of them out there. Um, but his performance in here as, as the Conqueror was just epic. Like, you felt his presence. Like, you knew he was dangerous and you knew he was going to be a threat. Um, the graphics, <coughs> honestly, being the Quantum Round was bright, excellent. Like I said, the only thing I really hate about this was Scott Lang's daughter. Other than that, it was on par with the rest of the Ant-Man films. And like I said, a, great, a lot of great performances. Why it didn't make more money? Well, I think box office wise, they were on par with all the other Ant-Man movies. Yeah, I think that's the, probably the, the biggest thing. Uh, to, Ant-Man's never been one of their biggest drivers. No, and you're right about that. The problem was they went so far like upping the budget that that's what probably made it look like uh, it wasn't going to be a great film because it's staying around the 400 million marker but yet they spent 250 to make the film but yeah Ant-Man film stayed around that 400 million you just kept upping the budget for no reason I get why you did it the, um, the graphics were excellent can't expect nothing less than that but yeah my number 5 Ant-Man Three Ant Man and the Wasp uh, into the Quantum Mania. Uh, my number four is a movie called Bottoms. Why did you switch him? Like, yeah, believe it or not, when I put this list together, Bottoms was six. It has climbed up to number four. Mm. I went into this movie thinking it was going to be a funny movie. It won't even make my top ten. No, no, it immediately made my top ten. How best describe Bottoms? Let's think. It is. A satire of high school rom rom com, where its core concepts are a Fight Club mixed with American Pie. <laughs> that is an interesting <laughs> uh, description of that. Ha Hazel is a just straight up terrorist. It blows up the car, one guy's bo guy's car at one point, and. Is I need to do a long view, a uh, longer review on this movie just because it's. So funny. Oh, God. The Marshawn Lynch is our teacher. <laughs> okay. It, it, uh, it does a good job balancing a lot of different aspects. It doesn't, like, browbeat you in the face. It doesn't try to be anything else other than just an over the top, raunchy comedy movie with some good points scattered throughout. The, way, the best way satire should be done. Sure, it's over the top, but you're actually making points as you go through. All, all these characters are memorable, they're quotable, and need to do a long review. Probably soon, in the next two weeks. Hmm. All right. My number four. And I guess this confused Justin because it's like a video game. Uh, my number four is Gran uh, Turismo. Turismo. Um, I don't know much about the games and all that. What excites me is I, I do enjoy racing. So anytime there's a racing movie, I, I, I definitely like to look into it. And, you know, being a, you know, a Formula One guy and NASCAR and just enjoy racing, period. I you had to enjoy those left turns. Hey, those <laughs> are epic left turns, okay? I'm not saying NASCAR is my favorite. <laughs> I'm not saying NASCAR is my favorite. <laughs> I'm just saying that I enjoy racing, and NASCAR is a part of racing. But I mean, on a grand scale, scale things, the, the the Le Mans, like oh god, those are so epic. Um, this was a a really awesome story that you know I think would encourage anybody to always reach for their dreams. There's a lot of emotions to this movie. Um, so basically, it's a video gamer uh, dream come true. A, a lot of fans are into the racing and they get recruited to join the racing academy and one of them becomes an actual race car driver. Oh, that's like so much more funny if you said that he became a race car. 
<laughs> Full stop. <laughs> um, so he goes through that battle, and then he gets in, and you know he's doing his thing, and he's still treating it like a video game. Some of the graphics of him helping him win, not win races, but finishing the top ten, they break it down like how he was playing the video game. There is, and this is based on the true story, which is actually pretty cool too. Um, then there's the emotion side of things, like his his dad's not really approving of him being a video gamer. Um, then when he gets into the racetrack, he has a bad, bad accident that kills the spectator, and you know the emotions behind that, um, so forth. Like you know he's a good guy, and now everybody's kind of like, it's not your fault. It's a free accident, and you know we've seen race car accidents that it's, they're just that they're accidents, um, and all the other drivers want him kicked out of the the race because he just got his racing license. And the only way that they can keep him in the league is he has to finish uh, the top three. He has to be on the podium at the Le Mans. And the Le Mans is a 24-hour race where teams, you got to have a team, you got to rotate drivers in and out. And they ended up coming in third uh, just barely. How much more? Uh, yeah, like 24 hours straight. Let's get the sleep deprived brains in that car. Well, they they do like every three four hour rotations where driver one gets a six hour break. Um, they all get six hour breaks in between, but uh, you do see like it's a lot of wear and tear even when you're resting that they have to hurry up. It was a really great feel good story. Uh, I do like some of the camera angles. Um, one of our favorite actors in there is uh, David uh, Harbaugh. No, yeah, David Harbaugh. Yeah, he was um he was the coach who was once a race car driver, but. He got in an accident and it made him surly. It just made him not want to do it ever again. So he became a chief engineer on designing race cars. Um, he helps train the gamer to become a race car driver. It's it's such a actual feel good movie that um you know it deserves probably a lot more credit. I know some people criticized it because it was more focused on the driver's 2015 uh, race that did kill the person, but. Unfortunately, that's part of the story. Um, but that is my number four. Your number three. I guess you can recap it. Yes, it's Evil Dead Rise. <laughs> Staff for the for the win. <laughs> <laughs> I love that part. At the beginning of the movie, you see her pulling the head off the doll, and you're like, what's going on with that kid? And then it turns out it's for Stephanie. It's like, that is the best thing ever. Right there. <laughs> I feel like my daughter's going to do that. I hope so. I, I, I if not, I will, I will get her that for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, poor soul. I don't know. Uh, the gore was fantastic. The humor was a bit, uh, but it was still good, too. I love the trash talking. The Dead Knight's trash talking is top tier trash talking. <laughs> Almost no one does it better. Uh, I didn't really care for the blob monster at the end, or else this would have been this could have been higher. Yeah, that was that was a little off-putting. Because the mob was much scarier than the blob monster. Yeah, the blob monster was just entertaining because you're just like, what is that? What? Especially as the kids are being possessed too, the sister being possessed. Like I told you, to put the book back, Daddy. <laughs> Bam! Right in the bicep. <laughs> Oh my god. Uh, this was the, I love the main character, her little arc in this, of having to be responsible, like, parent over this child. Yeah, and she's not a responsible person. Yeah, I would say she's not a responsible person. <laughs> um, yeah, that's number three. Uh, my number three is Barbie. Uh, one of the only two, one or two mil billion dollar films this year. Yeah. This so close to being on my list, just by hair. It wasn't a musical. Yes, but the shit that they were singing yeah. was kind of like really on par. And like we were texting about this as I was watching it, because like my wife was like, the first maybe fifteen minutes was like kind of wacky, and my wife's like, turn it off. I'm like, you got to let it, it cook. You got to watch the film. <laughs> but I'm texting him at the same time, and I'm like. And he's like, you were talking about how like a lot of people bash it is like about the Ken, and Ken actually has a story arc. Yeah. And it's funny because it's like, um, you know, it evolves around like Barbie's um, abilities. I I guess starts to go from her statue because 
her owner in the real world is giving her up. Now, we were led to believe for a good minute that it was the daughter, but it's actually the mother. Okay, if anyone believed that, you're 12. <laughs> well, it was the first, like, second uh, that uh, it caught I'm going to be a little bro, be a little bro uh, on that one. Like, if you believed it, if you didn't see the twist coming down, then that's, like, uh, that's on you. <laughs> well, I, I caught on as it kept doing it, because I'm like, the angles plays a little bit of a different role. But, anyway, so Barbie goes into the real world. And Ken follows her because th- this version of Ken, played by Ryan Gosling, he follows her and he opens his eye. He sees like patriarchy <laughs> and horses. <laughs> yeah. He takes it back to Ken Land. And, oh, he takes it to Barbie Land to make it Ken Land. Yeah, and in between the goofiness, like even when he's singing, there's a there's a story that he's telling, like you know, and. In the real world, men are almost feeling like first, but then in Barbie Land, the men are are last. You know, nobody really cares about Ken. It's not Ken and Barbie. It's Barbie then Ken. And even the the songs, like he's telling you a story, like he's telling you how he feels. But then I also like the quick switch too. Like he goes from the goofy Ken doll to like how does it feel? Yeah. Like and replacing the Mount Rushmore with horses. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it, it's a story like people like you can tell the trolls who didn't pay attention to this movie. Who were like they're just bashing the patriarch. No, that's not big. They, they made jokes about the patriarch, but the point of the story was just be yourself. Yeah. Don't worry about trying to fit into any certain groups or anything. Just be who you are. Yeah, and you know it all. It all ends on a, uh, a happy note. But it, I see why this movie could reach. A billion that it did. I, I didn't think this movie was going to do as well as it did. I mean, I thought it would do good, and then yeah, you know, I, I'm put around like you know, like six hundred, seven hundred million, yeah. but a billion. But then when I watch, I can see why because it, it does kind of hit like all the audience. Yeah, like you do have the serious drama, you do have the the entertainment, you have the kid value. Because like even then, when I'm hearing some of these jokes, I'm like, how the fuck is this a <laughs> kid? Um, I think I'm not going to sit there and say this, like, this is the perfect movie, but it definitely reached all of the audience. For out. bringing a Barbie movie to the big screen, this delivered well above what it should have, what we thought it was going to do. Uh, absolutely. Um, so that is my number three. What, uh, what was it? The best line in the movie? Was, uh, when Margot was having a breakdown and you had the narrator step in and uh, Barbie's like, I'm not pretty anymore. And the narrator stood in and they're like, if you're gonna try to deliver this line, you can't cast Margot Robbie. <laughs> well, some of, some of the other what was the um, Rear Barbie? No, no, the uh, the disease that they were uh, mocking like every time, like so col- like. <laughs> yeah. Stay away from Sally. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's my number three. It was it was a really good movie. Uh, your number two. My number two, Resident Evil Death Island. Uh, I was so excited for this movie. It delivered on so many levels. I, I, my biggest thing was I loved the fact that we were getting all the main cast, right? We were getting Leon and Chris and Claire and Rebecca, all these characters we'd seen in the animated universe. And then we're getting Jill, too, on top of it. And it is it's picking up right after five, where she was uh, mind controlled by Wesker, and it's her trying to get back into the rhythm of things. And Chris being like, "You need to calm down." She's like, "Oh fuck you!" And <laughs> it all they all converge on the Alcatraz because that's where all the things lead. Oh, it's perfect, especially the finale where they're all coming together to fight together. So close to knocking off number one. Ah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Real quick, my number two is Guardians of the Galaxy 3. We really just touched upon it. It was a good send-off. Uh, I really did love um, Peter Quill's story uh, line, his depression, and then even <coughs> seeing Glamora, the, the alternate version of her, um, and knowing that there was still a spark. His finishing story, basically him just sitting on Earth, like since and just being with his grandfather, plain and simple. Uh, yeah, the rocket storyline was brutal. Like, obviously, you knew something, but them going into detail like that was 
fucking twist it. Um, I love the dog. <laughs> Cosmo. <laughs> yeah, Cosmo. There's a small group of people complaining about that dog. Cosmo is awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. Why did they cast a girl dog to play it? He was a boy in the comics. Who cares? Well, despite the fact that Cosmo was going to be a girl in the comics and the comic book code forced the change because they didn't want a girl dog. She still kicked ass. He's, he said I wasn't a good dog. Yeah, he's crazy a, people. <laughs> crazy people. <laughs> he said I wasn't a good dog. Say it. Say, say uh, I'm a good dog. I cannot say it if it is not a fact <laughs> that she is a bad dog. <laughs> That was it was this was such a fun ride. Uh, it really was. Um I think they did kinda little miss a little bit on the Adam Warlock um character. Well you know I did like the little swerve though, because I wouldn't expected him to be a big Hoss guy, so it was funny that he got pulled out too early. Yeah. And was a that's true. juvenile team because he wasn't allowed to cook all the way through. That makes sense. Um and he's still all powerful and everything, like no one really did much to him. Yeah, every time that somebody did, like, they never actually stopped him. They slowed him down. Yeah. Like, he just got back up and went at it again. Um, but, yeah, that's my number two, Guardians of the Galaxy. Our worst movies of the year time, because I don't like doing a full list, so just <laughs> name your worst movie. I was going back and forth, literally up until we started this video. It was between uh, Pet Cemetery Bloodlines off of Paramount Plus and Fast X. I am going with Fast X. Anything on st directly streaming can be a hit and miss. It truly can be. And Bloodlines was no exception. It was a miss. But you're not. You're going to get this or that. We know the Fast franchise is a billion, trillion dollar franchise. And they had a few extra years to give us something. This pretty much was them phoning it in. The graphics, which had to be a strong point for the franchise the last few years of the dumb shit they're doing, was beyond horrible. They pretty much just like, instead of staying in their character universe world, they just was wanting to do memes. Like, that that's all they wanted this film to be about. Let's, let's family this, family that, let's get that. Family? Have we talked about the family yet? Where's then, my corona? Yeah. Then you had them being in a going to a, another country within like the, the storyline, which yeah, it's usually weak anyway. This shit was just trash, and the fact that they are having a sequel, you know, Fast Ten Part Two, whatever the hell they want to call it, with the film ending where Dom and his son are at, like at the bottom of the Hoover Dam with like eight hundred fucking million burning cars falling on them. How are you going to survive that? Family is the power. You guys the gave up. The power of friendship and anime will allow him to survive anything. You guys gave up on this film. And well, it's I, all about Zerg's ending on the cliffhangers. It's all about part two. And I get that, but this cliffhanger was like them trying to be way too cute. It failed. It was miserable. And that's why you are worse than Bloodlines. At least Bloodlines had no hope. <laughs> you could, you, you failed to make a billion dollars. How dare you not make a billion? Like well, their fucking budget's like three, four hundred <laughs> million, so they had to. So my worst film of 2023, Fast X. <laughs> No, the real worst movie of the year is Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Fuck you, yeah, I knew you Fuck were going to Fuck that say. piece of shit. I knew you Fuck were going to Fuck that director, it. too, for throwing a goddamn tantrum on Twitter because people dare say bad things about a movie where you failed to write a good fucking play. You couldn't write mediocre fucking dialogue. <laughs> oh, Christopher Rudd, he's my wife, my fiance, my wife, in the span of five fucking minutes. Which one is she there, Chris? <laughs> Let me throw in some real fucking bullshit about this woman who's come out here to try to get away from her stalker and try to find a bit of normality because I don't know how to make fucking writable characters. So let's just take real world issues that people have and handle it with all the fucking sensibility of a toddler with a goddamn glass vase. <laughs> yeah. You pick a slow walking through a pool and oh, no one can get away from fucking that. 
The BDSM, we need the poo going on here. You took a great fucking idea that could have been a lot of fun, but because you're just a fucking idiot who's incapable of writing fun, this is what we get instead. And that's why that's my number eight, because it's, it's so bad. We'll talk about fun here in about three seconds. Well, let's let's do it. Our number one film, we Let agree. We tied on number one. Is Cocaine, Cocaine Bear. Bear. <laughs> so, let me tell you, like for me. Everything this is, is all Winnie the Pooh could have been. You want to talk about, like when the preview came out. It came out, you know, I want to say like probably February, September of last year. I thought, my God, you want to talk about what a dumpster fire is going to be about. <laughs> I, I didn't even need to see the trailer. Just bear on cocaine. Oh, uh, I'm sold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Going there. What we get was a fucking fun ride. All the characters were fun. They were insane. Zany antics. It all played off so well off together. That bear would just not <laughs> stop. The co then you throw in the bear on cocaine. He's snorting coke off of just severed limbs. <laughs> And then he like he gets sick and and, and weak if he's not on cocaine. <laughs> okay. uh, how do you want to make this even more entertaining? Let's give him bear cubs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, dusted white and cocaine because they're frolicking around in the bags. <laughs> this uh, is a big year for Elizabeth Banks. She's behind cocaine bear. She's the producer on Bottoms. Wow. Yeah. Even uh, in Bottoms, I did bring it up, but one of the actresses in that was the voice of April in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie. Huh. That could have easily been on your list instead of number eight. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Cocaine Bear was just a fun ride. I think it was just entertainment. There was good, good actual story. Like you know, it the bear <laughs> was like the main character, but then like there was still the drug dealers trying to get the yeah. You had the dealers trying to get back their uh, supply. You had uh, the mom trying to collect the kids who bailed out because. They want to go paint the waterfall. That's lovely time. <laughs> lovely time. The violence, the bear chasing the paramedics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who would have thought, like, the <laughs> movie of the year came out literally, well, this was, like, February? February. Yeah. Yeah. I think I called that in my review too. You that, did. Uh, Cocaine well, Bear would be the movie to beat. I think you did that in in our um, movies to look forward to in twenty twenty three. Pretty sure you put Cocaine as like the movie of the year, and you're like, it's going to be hard to top it. Yeah. And I That's guess a, it did. It, it nothing topped it. Buddy, that was like actually a heartwarming moment. It's like, how did you end up here? How did this happen? Why am I cheering on this bear? <laughs> yeah. And you had the heroic. Arrival of the bear at the top of the waterfall. <laughs> I like when they shoot the bear, and like the only way to revive the bear was <laughs> oh, okay. He climbed back up and spit the bullet out. <laughs> yeah. I remember you texting me like, or saying something like, "That's how he, that's how the hero is really gonna do." <laughs> I think this this brought. Um, I was down in Maryland, uh, Maryland uh, in our family cabin, and. <clears throat> Nice theater down by the family cabin, but um, we went to go see it there because I'm like, we have to go see it. I'm like, we gotta go review it, and yeah. So that is our number one movie of 2023, Cocaine, Cocaine Bear. Bear. Before we leave, I'm looking forward to 2024. Uh, Chills and Thrills is coming back. Movie Talk is coming back. We got new ideas for reviewing. Uh, we're going to get better in 2024. Thank you all for joining us on this ride. And Comment what your favorite movie is down below. And tell, the worst one, too. Tell Paulie why Winnie the Pooh is the worst fucking movie this year. <laughs> Until next time. Bye-bye.